I'm Joe Fryer. Thank you for joining us and happy Pride. This month's festivities come 53 years after the Stonewall uprising and seven years after the Supreme Court ruling that legalized same-sex marriage across the entire country. And for all that progress that's been made, the LGBTQ community is facing increasing backlash and intimidation, and those threats are not just rhetorical. In Idaho, police arrested 31 men affiliated with a white nationalist group near an annual LGBTQ LGBTQ event. Police had received prior threats from, quote, opposing groups leading up to it. The local police chief said he saw evidence the group allegedly planned to create a confrontation. And in California, authorities opened a hate crime investigation after a drag queen story hour was disrupted by men who witnesses described as members of a white national group. Police said the men shouted homophobic and transphobic slurs and caused people to fear for their safety. The event hosts children and their families. With stories like these making headlines on this Pride Month, it is no surprise that celebration is mixed with trepidation. It's the time of year when ribbons of rainbow wind around streets and storefronts as if copious coats of multicolor paint were generously splashed across the country. Yet this year, many in the LGBTQ community fear that burst of color has been muted by a blast of bluster. When did our public schools, any schools, become what are essentially grooming centers for gender identity radicals? Strong language accompanied by a barrage of legislation aimed to curb some of the important gains made over the decades. So far this year, more than 300 anti-LGBTQ bills have been introduced in 36 states. Many target transgender youth, looking to strip them of gender-affirming care or sideline them from playing on sports teams that match their gender identity. One of the largest and loudest battlefields in this culture war is Florida. That's where Governor Ron DeSantis signed a controversial bill that prohibits classroom instruction on sexual orientation and gender identity for many young students. Critics called it the Don't Say Gay Bill. The governor's press secretary called it an anti-grooming bill, an old homophobic trope that's finding new life. Childless, wacky gay activists want to drive... Uh, the White House, the Democrat Party. Well, what's happening in our schools is sexual influence peddling. They want to take control of our children. Grooming is defined as a process by which a sexual predator cultivates a relationship with a potential victim. But these days, the word is being used to falsely link LGBTQ people to pedophilia, implying that young people are being recruited. It's a falsehood that Dr. Scott Hadlin, chief of adolescent medicine and mass general, was quick to dispel during a recent appearance on NBC News Now. I mean, to put a very fine point on it, of all of the teens that I've taken care of over the years, not one has ever told me that they became LGBTQ because they were somehow convinced to become one by a teacher. Identity, it comes from within. It's deeply personal, um, and it's not created by sort of just merely hearing about LGBTQ people in a classroom at any age. The grooming rhetoric is certainly not new. It has long been used to demonize the LGBTQ community. Like in the 70s, during Anita Bryant's Save Our Children campaign, she called gays and lesbians a threat to children. Her group is crusading to repeal a new Dade County law, which protects homosexuals in jobs and housing. Anita Bryant says no homosexual should have the right to teach her four children. She's stumping Miami with that message, and to those who call her a religious bigot, she tells of her Christian love. I love homosexuals, if you can believe that. I love them enough to tell them the truth, because I know that there is hope for the homosexuals, that if they're willing to uh, turn from uh, sin the same as any individual, that that they can be ex-homosexuals the same as there can be an ex-murderer, an ex-thief, or ex-anybody. Until recently, such tropes lingered on the fringes of the far right, part of the QAnon conspiracy theory. But this year, they've moved into the mainstream, echoed by conservative lawmakers and TV personalities. Historian Michael Bronsky calls it a reaction to all the progress made by the LGBTQ community. And this is the last-ditch effort. And I think last-ditch efforts always become more and more extreme. So saying grooming, saying pedophiles, um, is just taking a leaf from the QAnon book, right, of, of, of the most extreme conspiracy theories 
and and promoting them in, in like larger ways. Earlier this year in Michigan, a lawmaker accused State Senator Mallory McMorrow of wanting to groom and sexualize kindergartners. McMorrow, a straight suburban mom, fought back with a speech that went viral. We cannot let hateful people tell you otherwise to scapegoat and deflect from the fact that they are not doing anything to fix the real issues that impact people's lives. And I know that hate will only win if people like me stand by and let it happen. The backlash against the LGBTQ community takes many forms, much of it seemingly focused on limiting resources and support for young people. In addition to some of the laws we just mentioned, there are towns across the country banning many LGBTQ themed books from public schools and libraries. And many gay straight alliances are now facing new challenges. To dig deeper into how this is affecting students, teachers, and parents, we are joined by Will Larkins, a high school student in Florida. Rachel Stonecipher, a teacher in Texas. Lizette Trahieu, parent of a transgender child in Arizona. And Melanie Willingham Jaggers, the executive director of Gleason, which works to eliminate discrimination and harassment in K-12 schools. Thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate it. Will, you made headlines this year by giving your class a history lesson about the 1969 Stonewall Uprising. And that lesson came just days after the so-called Don't Say Gay bill was signed into law. Why was that so important for you to do? It was a pivotal point for LGBTQ people and our fight for acceptance in the United States. But when you ask most people and you ask most students and when I ask most queer or straight people at my school, they had no idea what, what it was talking about. Even my history teacher was unaware of the Stonewall Uprising. So, you know, it being a very important part of history and a very important part of history for my community, I thought it was so important to teach, especially now when they're doing everything they can to silence us and our history and our community. This Florida law, this controversial law, it doesn't officially take effect until July 1st. We know it's supposed to be directed at elementary school students. But, Will, do you feel like it's already having an impact even where you are at the high school level? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, one of the most frightening aspects of this is how much we don't know about how it actually will affect students and teachers. I know a lot of teachers personally at my school and surrounding schools that are leaving because they feel like they can't talk about themselves openly or their families openly because they're queer or they feel like they can't properly help queer students in uh, situations where they would be like the main support system because of this law. You know, as much as it's an attack against students and as terrifying as it is, not really understanding what's going on and being afraid to go into next school year as a queer person, it's just as scary for teachers. What do you think most kids your age, most kids your age think about the law? How is your generation responding? My generation sees any form of censorship, especially within education, as an attack on everyone because that's what it is. You know, it'll harm queer kids first and it'll harm uh, marginalized groups the most, but it will harm everyone. When you are censoring education, when you're censoring information, that is a slippery slope and my generation knows that. Many of us have stood up and have fought back and as terrible as the law is, there is a silver lining in really understanding that Gen Z will be the generation that changes things. Rachel, you were a teacher at a school in Texas and a sponsor of the Gay Straight Alliance there. And teachers would post small rainbow stickers outside classrooms to show their allies. Then administrators said those stickers had to come down. What was your reaction to that? And just overall, how important is that teacher student support system in school? Well, I would I would certainly like to echo what Will said, and um, I I would like to back him up on on the fact or the idea that this is an issue of freedom of information. Um, the situation with the stickers was that they were up and then they were down. It wasn't so much that we received a request to remove them; it was that they were suddenly scraped off of doors and windows, and so that caused concern among the students. And what I, uh, those who have seen what happened to me, um, understand that. Ultimately, my contract was terminated for asking questions about why they came down. That's all. This is totally an issue of whether we're willing to talk about 
the populations of our students who exist, who are LGBTQ, who are any other host of identities, um, part of our job as educators is to make sure that they are heard and that their concerns are are at least a, a, a cause for discussion, right, among us. And, and that did not happen with the stickers. The school district put out a statement saying that labeling certain classroom as safe havens for certain groups could communicate to students who do not see themselves reflected in that classroom's decorations that they are unwanted or unsafe in those rooms, basically saying straight students might feel unsafe. You mentioned your school, the school terminated your contract. What are your plans now? How important is it for you to stay in teaching? Well, um, my plans are are not at this point to stay in K-12. My sister's a math teacher and she resigned this year. It is a bad year for teachers. Um, and all of the teachers that I know um, have either already quit or are kind of living in fear that they're gonna say one word about social realities and get kind of thrown under the bus for it. So my, my aim is to teach on the college level to catch these kids at the next level when they move up. But I, that is sad to me because I got into K-12 specifically thinking, um, I, I care so much about teaching younger people English because I think they need to learn how to express themselves early and often. Um, and all of those values of sharing your perspectives, of considering other perspectives, of thinking critically and, and coming up with some kind of synthesis of different ideas, that just feels like it's been abandoned in these kind of recent attempts to just shut people down. Lizette, you have a 14-year-old child who's transgender. How's your child doing right now? He's actually doing really well. We're very lucky. Um, and I think the reason for that is because he's in a supportive home and in a supportive school district. And so all of his social environments are spaces where he can focus on being his best self instead of focusing on protecting himself from discrimination and bullying. You've been speaking out against anti-trans legislation where you live in Arizona. Still, lawmakers passed. The governor signed two bills, a sports ban, and then a law that bans gender-affirming surgery for minors. We should note that type of surgery for minors is incredibly rare. But what is the impact this legislation has had on your son and on your family? Um, I think that what's really important for people to understand is that this is the third year of anti-trans legislation. We've been fighting this since 2019. What started off as something like 20 plus bills um, has ultimately become 300 plus bills across the country. Um, and Arizona, in Arizona alone, we saw 17 anti-trans bills, two of them passed. It's disruptive to our lives and to our families um, it scares our children. So I think that we are in a critical space right now where we are seeing um, oppressive tactics that have been used for generations, right? What we are seeing with LGBTQIA youth in schools is also happening when you talk about critical race theory. There's an intersectional through line that is occurring from the beginning of um you know, the movement to desegregate schools to now and defunding schools has always been the goal. There was a point this year when a Republican lawmaker voted against an anti-trans bill, saying he was moved by personal stories he was hearing from LGBTQ families. I mean, something like that, does that give you hope? We were actually at that hearing. My son testified and, and so did I. And I can tell you that I was deeply moved and surprised by the outcome. I think that proximity changes hearts. And when you hear our stories and you hear directly from our children, you realize that we're families like any other family and that our kids just want to be themselves um, and that they are not um, imposing any sort of um, way of life or thinking on anyone else's children. Um, I think that he heard us that day and it was a powerful moment. And I, it, I felt relieved um, and then obviously devastated because we had, uh, we had two bills pass anyway. Melanie, as we're hearing right here, we're seeing gay straight alliances disappear in some schools. Some lawmakers say they want parents to be notified if a student joins a GSA. And mixed in with all that, these false tropes we're hearing, calling teachers groomers. How worried are you about all this? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm very worried uh, because what I understand is what I've heard the panel talk about so far, which is that an attack on education is an attack on democracy, right? What we're seeing are copycat bills, right, that are being pushed from Florida to Ohio. They're being pushed by a wealthy extremist agenda that is bent on, has always been bent on um, being anti-LGBTQ, right? In the 90s, they were against us as we were um, looking to limit bullying, right? Make it so that kids didn't have to experience bullying when they went to school. In the, in the 2000s, they were against uh, marriage equality, right? And now they've set their sights on LGBTQ plus kids, particularly trans kids, right? And Lizette hit the nail on the head, right? This is an intersectional attack, right? It's not just anti-LGBTQ plus attacks. It's attacks on the truthful telling of our history. This other side has one tactic. They've got bullying, they've got intimidation, and they've got lies. The whole purpose is silencing. Um, and as we heard, you know, teachers are leaving the profession. As we heard, students are hearing less support uh, from teachers. They're seeing their affirming teachers leave. We're seeing the burden put on families and on children increase as they themselves are fighting for equality, fighting to stop these bad bills. So, Melanie, what are the best ways that we can support LGBTQ youth, especially right now? Yeah. So every school needs to make sure that they're developing strong, comprehensive policies that focus on non-discrimination and they're able to implement those policies. Right. So not if something goes wrong, but when something goes wrong for a young person, they're able to go to a caring adult on site. They're able to point at the rules and say, hey, something went wrong for me. I need your help to make it right. Schools can invest in trainings for educators to make sure that they're equipped um, to show support and compassion to students and to share accurate knowledge um, of their experiences. And then finally, devoting resources uh, to GSAs that give students a place to find community, build power, and become leaders in their schools. We've seen, I've been so inspired by the walkouts, by the student organizing that's happening, particularly in Florida, but all over the country. We need more of that. Um, and I think that for the young people, Know that there are folks who are out here fighting every single day. We see you. We know what is possible, um, and we're not going to stop fighting. Will Larkins, Rachel Stone, Cipher, Lizette Trahue, and Melanie Willingham Jaggers, thank you all so much for sharing your personal experiences with us. We appreciate it. Coming up, after a leaked Supreme Court draft decision suggested the Roe versus Wade abortion rights ruling could be overturned, many are now wondering if same-sex marriage could face a similar legal challenge. This was the scene outside the Supreme Court in 2015 when it ruled in a 5-4 majority that same-sex couples have the right to marry. Now there's fear that ruling might be challenged. Joining me now to break down that possibility is NBC News Justice Correspondent Pete Williams. Pete, good to have you with us. So this fear for same-sex marriage rights came after we saw a draft decision suggesting the court could overturn Roe versus Wade and limit the right to an abortion. So if they do make that ruling, does it make any sense that same-sex marriage could be next? Well, Justice Alito, who wrote that draft, says no. He says that abortion is different. Abortion is a moral issue because there's a life at stake. He says this twice in the majority opinion or in his draft opinion. And let me quote from one part of it. He says, to ensure that it's not misunderstood or mischaracterized, this opinion concerns only whether there's a right to abortion and should not be understood to cast doubt on any other precedents. So you have Justice Alito's word for it. Secondly, while there are certainly these same sort of privacy, dignity kind of things behind the same-sex marriage, the Obergefell decision, one way to understand the same-sex marriage decision, it is really based on equal protection, something different. The fact that uh, the Supreme Court said that it was not equal protection, that a man could marry a woman, but a man could not marry another man, and so forth. I think there's something else at play here. Remember that from the day that Roe v. Wade was, uh, Roe v. Wade was decided in 1973, it was instantly controversial. It touched off a nationwide movement that never let up. There has been no such kind of response to the gay marriage decision in 2015. There hasn't been a nationwide movement to get rid of same-sex marriage. The third thing, I think, is public opinion. If you look at a chart of public opinion about abortion, it's remained very constant over the years. Whereas opposition to same-sex marriage has gone down, 
public support for same-sex marriage has gone up. Now, that's not a legal reason. That's a sort of political reason, but that's something else that factors in. So you can take it just as a little bit. It's word. You consider these other, other characteristics or you can look on the negative side and say that Justice Alito says in order for a constitutional right to be found in the Constitution, it has to be something that is uh, uh, a part of the uh, deeply rooted in American life and essential to ordered liberty. Now, under that test, same sex marriage would flunk. So you, you, you can either say that the draft Roe v. Wade decision has the seeds of Obergefell's destruction in it, or you can say that it won't count. Pete Williams, thank you so very much. Appreciate it. Now, as Pete just mentioned, since the Supreme Court ruling on same-sex marriage, we have only seen support for the right to marry grow. A new Gallup poll suggests 71 percent of Americans now support legal same-sex marriage. That is a new high. And that societal acceptance may be why we are seeing another new record. More American adults identify as LGBTQ than ever before. And a lot of that growth is due to a younger generation that feels comfortable coming out. I sat down with a group of Gen Zers to talk about this generational shift. They're called Gen Z, but many young adults proudly embrace five other letters, LGBTQ. I'm a lesbian. I'm gay. I'm bisexual. I'm transgender. I'm queer. A recent Gallup poll found that among Gen Z adults, those between the ages of 18 and 25, about 21% identify as LGBTQ. 21%. That's one in five. When you heard that number, what was your reaction? I really wasn't surprised. Our generation isn't really scared to actually say that we're part of the community and we're actually proud of who we are. With the help of Campus Pride, a national group supporting LGBTQ college students, we gathered this group of Gen Zers, Eddie, Nick, Marcus, Sierra, and Mary. They go to the University of Central Florida and are part of the first generation to totally grow up in a digital world. Social media, how important was that to you when you were younger? Oh, social media, it was like everything to me because it really helped me form a sense of myself. I remember writing in my diary as a kid that I had a crush on a boy just over and over and over just to pray that eventually I'll convince myself that I do. And I got introduced to these online communities and I finally saw, oh wait, I'm not a freak. There are people out there who feel the same way that I do. And that realization saved my life. And I don't want to add more stress to your day, but I love you. They could also see themselves reflected in traditional media, movies, and TV shows. Growing up and seeing even the smallest bits of representation in like LGBTQ plus characters and everything of that sort is just made me feel, you know, like not alone. And it made me feel like kind of understood. And perhaps no endorsement had a greater impact than the one delivered by the Supreme Court in 2015. Now to that historic Supreme Court decision legalizing same-sex marriage across the land. All of it creates a sense of belonging that mental health experts say is vital. The messaging that Gen Zers have is like it's okay to be who you are and to love who you love and to talk about that and celebrate that. A majority of LGBTQ Gen Zers say they're bisexual. And among those five letters, a growing number of young people identify as queer, which is perhaps most simply defined is not straight. I present as a boy, but I love pink or I love like feminine things, but at the same time, I could also like masculine things and I don't need to be in that set, like binary. For your generation, it's easier to come out than say my generation, but it's not easy, is it? No, no definitely mm-hmm. not. I feel like there's this huge disconnect. Oh, being queer is like a trend, but these are people's identities. These are people really putting themselves on the line and putting themselves in a place where they could be in danger. NBC Out is celebrating Pride with the Pride 30 list. It highlights the next generation of LGBTQ leaders, creators, and newsmakers. You can find the full list at NBCNews.com slash NBC Out. We wanted to showcase just a few of the amazing people included there. My hope for the future is that we as a community can see ourselves, especially our youth, as people to be valued. 
that we can see these differences be more than just that. We can see them as something to be valued, as something to bring a new perspective and bring our society forward into the future as positively as it can be. For all time, a new generation has been born into a strange world, not of their own creation. And it has been up to that new generation with bright and fresh new eyes to look at the world and see where it must grow. Like all living things, we change and grow. And it is the responsibility of our youth to bring us to that change. My biggest hope for the future is that we recognize the importance of activism. Um, I think it's essential. It's not an often hobby. It's a practice that should be woven into the fabric of our everyday lives. It's a life-saving recognition of human rights and, and how we can all be a part of creating a world where we all have access to these rights without undue suffering. Thank you for watching our Pride and Backlash special. You can always find the latest news about the LGBTQ community on NBC News Now and online at NBC Out. I'm Joe Fryer. Have a very happy Pride.